So, all right. So as I indicated to those that came in earlier too, um, my stylus is somewhere at home, I think on my table where I was prepping for today. Um, so course evaluations, that's my handwriting. Um, when I don't have a pen, when I'm just using the tip of my finger, I didn't have a stylus unless someone has a stylus with them. Maybe you got a stylus on the end of your pen or something like that. I didn't think so. Anyways, um, here we go. So going back to this is the, oh, that's right. We did these sinusoidal type functions. So having this idea of um, f of x equals a times sine of b theta minus h, and then I ran out of room on the right already, plus k. Uh, and the plus k, really, if you think about it like this, back when we used y, it's y minus k equals a. And remember when we say sine, it's sine of, or cosine of, or positive, negative cosine or negative sine, uh, b theta minus h. So there it's looking a lot like we did with all of those conic section functions. Y minus K and H, X minus H. That tells you where the center is in a sinusoidal function. It tells you where the center is in terms of was the beginning of the sine curve or cosine curve shifted left or right? If so, it was shifted that much. So if it's theta minus H, that means it's shifted to the right. If it's theta plus H, it's shifted to the left. If it's Y minus K, that means it was shifted up. Right, but when we add it over here, plus k, that's why it was plus k. So the, the, the middle line of the curve is shifted up. If it's y plus k, then the entire graph was shifted down. But taking a look at our equation here, we, we know that the radius of a bicycle wheel, so if it helps, you can draw a picture. Bicycle wheel on the ground. 14 inches is the radius. And there is a red mark... I should have made my bicycle wheel a different color then. But there is a red mark at the bottom of the wheel. We'll make it a white mark. And it begins rolling down the street. It doesn't say which direction, it just says down the street. So typically, like, much like we do with the rest of the world, we read everything left to right. So we're going to assume that this bicycle wheel starts rolling that way. Write a formula for the height above the ground of that little spot. So when it gets to here, we want to know what the height is above the ground, h of t. Right. So at the very bottom, when I'm at the very, very, very bottom, the height is zero. When I'm at the very, 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 very top, the height is 28, which means my amplitude is 14. I'm starting at the bottom. I'm starting at the lowest point. So I got to remember, which one is that? Is that sine or cosine? And this goes back to the, if you just re recall what your functions look like. Sine runs, starts at the zero and goes like that. Cosine starts up and goes down and comes back up. And then the negative of each is you flip-flop it around. So this is cosine. This one's sine. Neither of, them, neither of which start at the bottom, per se. Sine starts in the middle. Cosine starts at the top. Well, if cosine starts at the top, the negative cosine starts at the bottom. And am I shifted left or right any? No, because I'm just, I'm, the bottom point is where I'm starting from. So inside of here, I'm going to have B theta. And then I have a vertical shift up of 14. How do I know it's a vertical shift up of 14? Well, because I never drop below the x-axis down here for cosine, all right? So the whole height function has to be shifted up 
so that the center line of my graph is half, you know, 14 to the top, 14 down below it, but I'm going to be never crossing the ground, stays on the ground, and that's my zero. So I have a horizontal, sorry, my vertical shift is up 14. Do I have a rotation rate? Nope, but it tells me something different, doesn't it? It doesn't talk about theta. It says write the formula for the height above the ground of the red point after the bike has traveled x inches. Well, that's a little different. Instead of talking about theta for my angle, it's talking about inches that the, tr that the bicycle wheel travels. So a couple ways about going about this. So let's say this was my point right here. And it travels to there. And, and realistically, what I should probably do is get rid of that. Because if it's going to go to the right, it's going to travel to maybe this point here. When it travels to that point, how far has it gone? It's gone that distance. With respect to theta, theta being that interior angle, how far has it gone? Because everything that we do with our angles and with sinusoidal curves is based on the theta angle. Well, this is how one problem can draw back from questions from past chapters pretty quickly. And you try to remember, well, how do we find arc length? I can possibly, I'm just going to move all this out of the way for a minute, derive the formula when I think about a circle. The entire circle's circumference is 2 pi r. So if I want a portion of my circle, say from here to here, okay, that's a bad central angle, that theta, if I want just this portion of it, well, I don't want the full circle. First full circle is 360 degrees. I want pi, I want theta 360ths of that circle times the actual circumference. So this would say I want this ratio of the whole circle theta of the whole thing, and the whole thing for length is 2 pi r. But I'm mixing and matching here, which is bad math. This is radians, this is degrees. So I need to either flip-flop them to both degrees or flip-flop them to both radians. And we typically want to be in radians because that's how mathematicians think. We don't think in degrees anymore. So I'm going to change 360 degrees to radians. Remembering my unit circle, 360 degrees all the way around, that's 2 pi. Well, look at that. Arc length is equal to theta times r when you're dealing with a circle. Do you have to memorize the formula? No. Is it helpful sometimes to have it memorized? Sure. Am I going to give it to you for any exams? No. Can you have it on a sheet of paper? Sure. Can we have anything else on that sheet of paper? Yes. What? Anything you want. Formulas, words of encouragement, scripture references, you name it past problems that you've done as examples to do, sure. One piece of paper, front and back if you wish, handwritten only. You can put a lot on a sheet of paper when you handwrite only. But anyways, now back to here. So I don't want B theta with respect to this problem, I want how far it traveled. 
Well, how far does it travel? Well, it's going to be theta times r. Well, what is theta? We don't know. What's my r? 14, that's good. So I need to find theta, but not theta with respect to theta, but theta with respect to the length of the circumference. So back over here, when we derived the arc length, it says with respect to how far it's traveled in x inches. So my equation over here was s equals, which really should be x equals, because that's the arc length, theta times r. So what is theta equal? x over r. So this theta up here will get replaced with x over r. I'm not actually caring about the period length when this is going on. So the b is, believe it or not, irrelevant. Cosine. I'm getting messy here. Let me just restart it. The height with respect to t is equal to negative 14, my amplitude. It's negative cosine. x over r which is 14 plus fourteen. That would then be the final form of that particular sinusoidal. So here, again, just another slightly different way of presenting a similar problem to what we've done in the past with a sinusoidal curve. Sometimes we're talking about the rotation of theta. This time we're talking about how far it travels in inches, which is a function of theta relative to the length of x of that arc length. So as I was just saying, this is h of x relative to the length. And the discussion we we're having is what is b? b is the um, period, but now we're not talking time, so it's the period is just going to be one full rotation. So one full rotation is 28 pi out of one full rotation, which is 28 pi. So, so we're not talking about how much time it takes, it's just overall length. So b ends up being one. Airplane flies from an airfield to a located located 300 miles east and 200 miles south of its current location. So however you want to think of something, I typically think in a Cartesian coordinate system. When they start talking directions, this is north. Current location is here. And I need to go 300 miles east. That would be to the, to the right. And then 200 miles north, 300 200. At what heading should the plane fly? Well, I drew it as a vector because eventually it would be once we know speed. But it asks, at what heading should the plane fly? Sounds like angles to me. And again, this takes us way back, All right? Tangent of theta will equal 200 over 300. Take the inverse tangent to both sides. Theta equals inverse tangent of 2 thirds. Theta equals 33.69 degrees north of 
east. The hard part when you get to final exams is realizing some questions do actually come across as simple as they sound, even though we're doing some more complicated things now. Don't know if you guys have one of these or your parents have one for you. A 529 plan is a college savings plan in which a relative can invest money to pay for a child's later college tuition. The account grows tax-free. So if Lily wants to set up a 529 account for her new granddaughter, wants the account to grow to 40000 over 18 years, so maybe this should have been like 18 years ago she wanted to do this in order to cover some of this year's, right? Because... 18 years from now, college will probably cost more than $40,000 since it already does. Anyways, um, so aside from the practicality of this, she believes the account will earn 6% compounded semi-annually, that is twice a year. How much will Lily need to invest into the new account? So we go, oh, sounds like a growth function. Amount with respect to time is equal to principal times 1 plus R. But it's not just R, it's R over N raised to the NT power. N is how many times per year or per whatever period we're talking about. Here it's talking about semi-annually. So T is, uh, in this scenario, T is years. N is 2. R is 0 0.06. I want my ending amount after 18 years to be 40K. Set up my equation, 40,000 equals P times one plus 0 0.06 over two raised to the two times 18. And then it becomes a matter of, can you operate your calculator successfully? So 40,000 equals P times 2.89827832828, give or take. And then 40,000 divided by that number. Initial investment should be 13,801.297, so $0.30. Sorry, ran out of room there. Again, I'm not written with my stylus, I'm written with my index finger, but. All right, so growth functions. This is an exponential growth function. It's not growing real fast. And again, this is assuming that I just plugged it into my calculator the right way. It's always good for you to verify that you get those same numbers too. And if you got it different than me, check and see if maybe I made a mistake. It's been known to happen. We have another growth model type scenario. Car was valued at 24000 in the year 2006. The value depreciates to 20000 by year 2009. Assume that the car value continues to drop at the same percentage. So its value or amount is equal to its principal value, which is your starting amount. One, in this case, it's going down. And it's just annual, so it's R over 1 to the T years. So best case scenario when you're doing problems like this is don't put 2006 in as a time. Call 2006 times zero. That's my time zero. So 2009 would be time equals three. And I want to find out what it is in 2014. So it would be time equals eight. Right, just eight years after, because you're adding eight. My ending amount is 20,000. My initial amount was 24,000. 
1 minus r to the third power. So I have 20 over 24. It's equal to 1 minus r to the third power. So take the cube root to both sides, subtract the one, and then make them both negative, or move the r or move them over, however you want to do it. My rate is 0 0.058964. Four. That is the rate of depreciation. Right. Or you could say it grows, if you want to think about it that one. Uh, it grows at a rate of negative 0.94. But that, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So the depreciation rate is point whatever I just had there. Um, which means inside the parentheses it's that value. So now... Rewrite my formula, A equals 24,000 times 0 0.941036 raised to the eighth power, because that would be what it is in 2014. Again, assuming you can operate your calculator successfully, I'm not going to do that. But for that last part, what is the value when my car, when will the car be worth $500? Why 500, you say? That was the amount I paid for my first car a long, long time ago. So when will that happen? I will have 500 over 24,000, 0.02083 repeating, equals 0 0.941036 to the t power. Remembering, how do we solve exponential functions? Well, the inverse of exponential functions are logs, logarithmic functions. So if I take the log of both sides, on the right side, properties of logs indicates that after I take the logarithm, which I'll go ahead and do, log of 0 0.941036 to the t, Powers in, of logs taken to powers, that variable gets to come out in front. So that will equal t times all of that stuff, log of that number, which means t equals over here log of 0 0.02083 repeating divided by the log of 0.94. 1036. Again, assuming I can operate my calculator successfully, round it up 63.70 years would be how old that vehicle was. Assuming an actual static depreciation of 6% every year. That's how long that would take. A paraboloid is if you take a parabola and you like spin it around its line of symmetry. You're going to have a, a bowl in the shape of a parabola. So this means it can be formed by rotating a parabola around its axis. So receivers of satellite dishes are para, paraboloids. Uh, if you've seen satellite dishes, if you haven't, go outside and look around. You'll find one. 
so if we have a paraboloid that is 12 feet across, so this is 6, and it's 4 feet deep. Granted, this is not to scale, but we'll call that 4. So this end of my parabola would have coordinates 6, 4. This end of the parabola would have coordinates negative 6, 4. We want to find out where the foci is, somewhere here, because when a signal comes into a satellite dish, because of the properties of a parabola, it will reflect it to the focus. So we got to remember what's my generalized form, not in terms of knowing the center, although that's not a bad thing, y minus k. All right, we'll have x minus h squared. But then there were those other things that were part of that standard portion and said it depended on how you wanted to write it, but it's this, where it's 4p. And P is the distance to the directrix from the vertex. It's also the distance to the focus from the vertex. Being that I'm setting up my own equation, I can set it so that I make my vertex at 0, 0, which makes it a whole lot easier. So I have 4PY equals X squared. And I have a point, 6 comma 4. So this over here is 16p, because the y value is that. And then this is 36, p equals 36 over 16, which is 2.25. So the coordinates of that with how I have it drawn would be 0 comma 2.25. Or to think about it in terms of what the context of the question is, you would place the receiver 2.25 feet up from the center bottom of your satellite dish. 2.25 feet. Am I in feet? Yeah, feet. More functions. Determine the shape, focus, or foci, foci or focus, whether there's one or two, two or one, I should say, foci, two, focus, one. Center and any other characteristics that you can think about with whatever this is. So first off, you say, do I, can I tell what kind of a shape it's going to be just by looking at it right here? And the answer is maybe. One, I know it's not a parabola because they're both squared. It is not going to be a circle because the x squared and the y squared do not have the same coefficient. They would have to have the same coefficient for it to be a circle. So then I'm left with hyperbola or ellipse. One of them is added, the other one's subtracted. It appears as though this will be hyperbola because it's subtracted. If they're added, it's an ellipse. But either way, the first step first I want to do is I want to have all my variables on one side, numbers on the other, which I have. And then I'm going to do some completing the square. So I'm going to take those first two, the y values, factor it for y squared minus 4y. And then I'm going to complete the square. Process of completing the square is I take half of the middle number, which is negative 2, and square it and add it. And over here on the right side, I'm going to have 1 plus, but it's not going to be plus 4. It's going to be plus 16 because if I were to multiply this back out, it's not going to be 4 here. It's going to be 16 because it's multiplied by the 4. So that 4 is trapped inside the parentheses. When it comes out of the parentheses, it's multiplied by the 4. So that's why I added 16 to both sides. And again, we're balancing. you got to have the exact same thing, left-hand side, right-hand side when you're doing the equation. So then... I'm going to take 
this. And I'm going to see if there's anything I can factor out of both. When we're doing completing the square, it's ideal if I can have it as x squared as a positive. So I'm going to factor the negative 1 out. Then this will be plus 2x. And then it's going to be plus something else. And that something else, again, for completing the square, I take the middle term, 2, half of it. Well, half of 2 is 1. Square that number. 1 squared is 1. Much like the other side, though, I'm not adding a 1 over here because the 1 is trapped inside the parentheses, which is being multiplied by a negative. So I'm actually adding a negative 1 to both sides. So again, this negative 4 I took in half, negative 2. Negative 2 squared is positive 4. The reason why I do that is now this factors into y plus 2 squared. I have the 4 out in front. Minus x plus 1 squared equals 16. And then for it to be a hyperbola or an ellipse, I need it to equal 1 on the right-hand side. So to do that, I divide by 16. And I'll have y plus 2 squared over 4 minus x plus 1 squared over 16 equals 1. And then I can start naming fun stuff like... My center is at negative 1, negative 2. I need to remember how to find c squared. c squared being the distance from the center to the foci. And that was a squared plus b squared. Not in the same way that we had for right triangles, but c squared equals 20. Those are the two numbers that are down there that are already a squared and they're already b squared in the generalized form. Uh, so my c is equal to the square root of 20, which is 2 root 5. So if I go 2 root 5 up and 2 root 5 down, I can find my foci. I know that this will be a vertical hyperbola because my y squared is positive. It's the positive value. I can use the formula for uh, y minus k equals plus or minus uh, a over b x minus h, those would be my two lines of uh, my two asymptotes, my slant asymptotes for this. And depending on how it's set up will depend on which one is a and which one is b. All right, so it's going to either be 2 over 4 or 4 over 2 for the slopes. <coughs> and then you would need to find the vertices. All right, finding polar coordinates. So polar coordinates are of the format r comma theta. So if I have a Cartesian coordinate of negative 3, negative 4, negative 3, negative 4, there's that point. The radius is my distance from my origin. So if this is 3 and this is 4, then my radius is 5. Now, technically, it's negative and negative. So right now, already, I have this. But now i got to find theta. All right, well, I've got a triangle. Call that theta. And I have, well, I now have all three sides. 
So pick, take your pick. But I'm going to usually go with the two numbers they gave me to start with, which is adjacent and opposite. So tangent of theta is equal to negative 3 over negative 4. So theta will equal the inverse tangent of, that's a negative 1, uh, 3 fourths. Because negative over negative is a positive. So if I have 0.75 and I do inverse tangent, if you're in degrees, it gives you something like 36.87. But we know that we're not at that degree value. Because the way I'm drawn, that would be in the first quadrant. I'm in the third quadrant. So either, well, you can either work it as adding degree measures to get yourself around there, uh, or you can do this in radians and then do the same thing, but trying to figure out if it gave me a theta here, oh, I'm trying to do wrong thing, right here, that's three over and four up. I mean, it's a straight line across when I'm doing it. So in degrees, you're just adding 180 to get over there. Or if you're doing it in radians, you're going to add pi to get over there. It all depends on what we're dealing with. Um, and again, since mathematicians typically operate in the land of radians, we're going to want to find this as a radian measure. So if I do 0 0.75 inverse tangent, my theta value is equal to 0.6435. And then I want to add pi to that, which is, yep, just literally plus 3.1415926, etc. So my theta is 3.7894. And if I were to take the tangent of that, it would give me approximately 0.75. So now I have my Cartesian point listed as a polar coordinate. I'd probably want to put in here radians for my, my units there. Now if I have it in polar, I need to write it as a Cartesian. <clears throat> I am going to get rid of my denominator. R times 1 minus 2 cosine theta equals 3. I recall, or attempt to recall, that x is equal to r cosine theta, and y is r sine theta, and I notice that I have a cosine theta right here. So I could take this cosine theta and rewrite it as cosine theta equals x divided by r. Just divide both, you know, right? Divide the r over, move it to that side, and I'm going to swap that in. r times 1 minus 2 times x over r equals 3. r minus 2x equals 3. r equals 3 plus 2x, and this was my goal, because, well, I'm not done, I'm now going to square both sides. Why? Because I know what r squared equals. So I have x squared plus y squared equals 9 plus 12x plus 4x squared. And, and at this point, technically, I'm in Cartesian. I mean, really, if I just swapped this out with x squared plus y squared, I'd be in Cartesian. 
But here it might be good to then say, well, what kind of a shape will this be? So if I move all my numbers to one side or all my variables to the other side, however you want to think about it, I'll have negative 3x squared minus 12x plus y squared equals 9. It appears that I'm going to have myself a hyperbola. I'm going to convert this to polar. <clears throat> r sine theta equals 3r cosine theta plus 2. r sine theta minus 3r cosine theta, moving all my variables to the left, equals 2 r sine theta minus 3 cosine theta equals 2. r equals 2 over that mess. Sine theta minus 3 cosine theta. And that would be converting a linear equation into polar coordinates, or a polar equation. Now we're going to change this to polar. The nice thing when I see problems like this, right away, boom, that's r squared. And it's remembering that that's r squared. And then 3 is r cosine theta. That's what x is. x is r cosine theta. Going to move everything to one side. r squared minus 3r cosine theta equals 0. r times r minus 3 cosine theta. Ooh, I'm sorry, getting a little extra markings in there equals zero. And the reason why we're doing this when, I, when I'm setting it up to zero, well, first, first thing I'm doing is I'm just moving my r's to all to one side so I can try to find a way to solve for r. Now I'm setting it equal to zero, so it's like back in the day when I had quadratics. Oh, well, what makes this zero? Well, when r is zero, well, that's not a very fun equation. r is zero, that means I have no radius. Theta can be anything, and r is zero, I've defined a point at that point. R equals zero is just a point. But then I've got this equation as the other part. So when is R minus three cosine theta equal to zero? Well, that's when R equals three cosine theta. And that is a polar equation for that circle. Alright. Polar form for a complex. Euler's method down here is the way we should probably stick to. It's a lot easier. So r is radius again and when I'm doing this, this is my x direction, this is my i direction. Or sometimes they don't call it x, they call it a. So it's a plus bi. So I'm negative 3, 1, 2, 3, negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. My radius is right there. This is negative 3. This is negative 5. It's negative 5i, but I'm, yeah, in the, in the i direction. So my radius, again, Pythagorean theorem, 25 plus 9, 34. My radius is the square root of 34. So z equals square root of 34, e to the i, much like we did before, we need to find this theta, which means probably going to use this theta first with the inverse tangent function, because I've got these two numbers. It's going to give me this value for this theta, because it would be 3, 5, and then you just have to add pi to it, doing it in radians, much like we did the last one. And I can't remember that theta off the top of my head. It's a three-fifths. 
it's probably going to be around one. Uh, just because pi halves is where it is. So somewhere in that ballpark. And then you would take whatever that number is, one point something, and add pi to it, 3.14159, to get this value over here. I'll leave that to you so we can get through one more slide or two. Uh, find the component form of the vector with length 7 and angle of 135. Hundred and thirty five degrees. Nice thing for us is that means this is forty five degrees right there. And if I'm out here at seven, I know from my unit circle that in a unit circle, this is the square root of two over two negative. This is root two over two positive because that's forty five degrees. And I'm seven units out, which means my vector would be negative seven root two over two, comma, seven root two over two in component form for that vector. Uh, skip over that one. We'll parameterize this. Parameterize means make it a parametric equation. Usually, in an equation like this, I look at the, which one's more complicated. The y is more complicated. A lot more is going on. So I'm going to say, well, let y equal t. If I do that, then x equals t squared minus 2t. So that is y of t equals t. x of t equals t squared minus 2t. And that is all there is to that. Parameterizing a Cartesian equation is usually easier than the other way around. Well, that's my last slide.